more people from Germany. Awesome. Okay, I think we are just about ready to get started. So, good afternoon again, everyone. And hi, my name is Olivia Lanes from IBM Quantum. We're very excited to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. The seminar takes place Friday at noon Eastern time on the Kiskit YouTube channel. So, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do that. Uh, I'm your host for today. My name is Olivia, like I said, and I'm very excited to be here with uh, James Wooten for today. So uh, go ahead and say hi, James. Hi. For um, a quick introduction about James. James did his PhD at the University of Leeds on topological quantum computation and then did a postdoc at the University of Basel in the, the condensed matter theory group. In 2016, he created a citizen science project aimed at helping the public get involved in quantum error correction research. And that's also when he started using the quantum computers that IBM had just put on the cloud at that time, which led him to joining the IBM Research Lab in Zurich in 2018 and continuing to work on both error correction and quantum computation outreach. So thank you so much for being here today, James. Um, we're really excited for this talk. I'll let you take it away here in just a second. I think we have your slides pulled up, but I just wanted to remind everybody that you can feel free to ask questions throughout for James in the chat, and I'll monitor those and uh, do my very best to politely interrupt you whenever we have some questions. So I'll just let you take it from here. Okay, thanks for the intro. Thanks for having me to give the talk. And yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about trying out uh, quantum error correction on IBM quantum hardware, uh, because this is the way I want to phrase this mostly, we have this hardware on the cloud and we can do things with it. And uh, one of the most important things to do in quantum computing is quantum error correction. So it's great to try out how that can be done. Um, okay. So I'm going to be uh, mostly talking about work that I did in a paper that I put on the archive recently, which is this one called hexagonal matching codes with two body measurements. Uh, but for this, I have to explain what matching codes are. So I'm also going to go through some of the things from my uh, paper from uh, what is now five years ago, six years ago, somehow, uh, which um, with this much, with this, it has a title that's a, a lot more technical seeming, but, you know, we'll, we'll work out how what it's all about. Um, so I should really talk about what quantum error correction is. Uh, and well, quantum error correction is a way of taking information and encoding it such that it can be uh, better protected, such that we can see the effects of any noise and we can remove those effects. And this is done by the way we encode the information. And one of the primary ways that we think of encoding information in quantum computers is uh, by these things called stabilizer codes. So what we do in stabilizer codes is we have a number of noisy qubits, let's call that N, and we want another number of effectively noiseless qubits, let's call that K. So the noisy qubits are going to be the actual physical qubits on the device. So for a superconducting qubit, it's going to be these little two-body uh, or two-level systems that we uh, abstract out of a, a superconducting a resonator. But um, the noiseless qubits are not going to be physically the same. They're going to be encoded across many of the noisy qubits. Um, and so they're going to effectively be qubits. They're a bit more abstract. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the number K for so the number of noiseless qubits we have is going to typically be less uh, or quite a lot less than the number of physical qubits we have. So it's, we're going to take a lot of overheads in building these noiseless qubits. But they're what we need in order to run algorithms. So how do we take many noisy qubits and create few noiseless ones? Well, what we basically do is set a bunch of constraints that our noisy qubits are supposed to satisfy. And we keep on um, measuring to see if those constraints are being satisfied. And if they are, then everything's good. And if they're not, then it gives us a clue as to what has gone wrong. And then we can uh, try and work out how to fix it. Um, so these constraints, they have to commute and be frustration free, which is just a way of saying that it, it should be possible to satisfy all of the constraints at the same time. And they should also be independent. Um, so it's, uh, uh, satisfying some of the constraints doesn't imply that you satisfied others. And so once you've got N minus K of these constraints, you've got enough information 
to completely cover uh, all the noise that could occur. And then one very simple example of this is uh, the repetition code. The repetition code is not actually very good for creating noiseless qubits, but noiseless bits. Nevertheless, it uses all our same theory, so it's a nice, good test code to look at. And uh, what you're, what the constraint that you're measuring here is basically you're you're, you're treating your qubits as bits. You only care about the zero and one values, and you take pairs of these qubits and you say. Uh, that you want their values to be the same. You don't care what their values are, you just want them to be the same. So you want them to either both be zero or both be one. If that's true, then that's good. And if they are different, then that's bad. And so you do a measurement where you just see, are they the same or different? And if you think of them living on a line, then if you take all of the n minus one possible neighboring pairs and you uh, apply this constraint, then uh, that gives you n minus one constraints. But then, if you were to have, say, you apply this constraints to next to neighboring pairs, and that would not be independent uh, because you can already infer that information from the ones that you have. So, just looking at the neighboring pairs is enough to completely tell you whether everything is the same or different from everything else, and you have one piece of information left over which is are they all zero or are they all one and you use that to restore your bit um but we're not actually talking about the repetition code at the moment but it's just uh, to give you a very a, a simple example one that's um easier to understand so in this uh, work we are going to do measurements so if you go into Qiskit and you do a measurement there is a measurement operation you can do and it's quite um, a, a well-defined thing. You give it a qubit and it will measure it and it will give you out a zero or a one. And it's basically looking to see if it's in the zero or the one state. And if it's zero, it tells you zero. And if it's one, it tells you one. This is actually only one of an infinite array of ways that we can measure qubits. And for this work, we are going, and for quantum error correction in general, we have to have a bit more of a general understanding of how measurement works. Uh, so actually, when we run the circuits, it will be these simple measurements that we get in Qiskit that we are actually doing. But um, in principle, other kinds of measurements exist, and we are able to indirectly do those measurements by creating a uh, quantum circuit that does the job we need it to do. Anyway, let's go through a bit more of this uh, general way of understanding measurement. So if we think of the Z gate, then if you apply the Z gate to the zero and the one state, then nothing happens. So for the zero state, completely, absolutely nothing happens. You get exactly the same state that you began with. If you apply it to the one state, then you get a phase of minus one. But if this is, this is if you're just applying it to the one state, this is a global phase on the wave function and therefore it's uh, physically um, indistinguishable from nothing happening. So in both cases, uh, if you just have a Z acting on a zero or a one, you'll see no effects in your final measurements. And so we say that they are eigens, these two states are eigenstates of the Z operator because they are unaffected by the Z operator, but they have different eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues are these uh, phases that come on the wave function when we apply the gate. And so uh, z uh, the zero state has an eigenvalue of plus one, the one state has an eigenvalue of minus one. So this concept of the standard measurement, which just looks at the zero and one states and tells us which we have, we can, we can say it in a more complicated way, as it being that we are measuring uh, the eigenstates of the Z gate and determining which eigenvalue they have. So, Measuring the eigenstates means we're trying to discern between zero and one. And measuring the eigenvalue means that, well, these two states differ by their eigenvalue. So we're trying to figure out which of those ones we have. Um, so when we've done that, we can also define other measurements in the same way. So the X uh, gate also has eigenstates. So what is the X gate? If you apply it to the zero state, it gives you a one. If you apply it to the one state, it gives you a zero. 
So they are obviously not its eigenstates because an eigenstate is something that is unaffected. They are very much affected. But if you take the superposition of zero and one, equally weighted superposition, then you've got zero plus one. And if you apply the X to that, you effectively get one plus zero, which is the same thing. Um, so the, this, what we call the plus state, which is a superposition of zero and one, is an eigenstate of X. And if you have what we call the minus state, which is sort of zero minus one, then that is also an eigenstate of X, but it's the one with the phase of minus one. So we can also define a measurement which determines whether we're in the plus state or the minus state, uh, and we call that the X measurement. And uh, that's not something that Qiskit gives us directly, and even more fundamentally, it's not something that superconducting qubits allow us to do directly, but we can we can find a way to do it. Basically, if you do a Hanamard, then a normal measurement, that's the same as doing an X, uh, a measurement of X. Uh, similarly, you can measure Y. It's, in, it's any single, yeah, you can measure a lot of things. But um, what we'll be interested in here is uh, applying this notion to multiple qubits. So for example, if we've got two qubits, we can define, so let's call them J and K, we can define um, the gate ZJ, ZK, which is performing a Z on qubit J and a Z on qubit K. So what are the eigenstates of that and what are their eigenvalues? Well, we already know that zero and one are the eigenstates of the Z gate. So for two Zs, then one of the eigenstates will be zero, zero. And just as the single qubit Z on a single qubit zero does nothing. Two Zs on two zeros does nothing. A more interesting one is when we do the Zs on two ones, because each of these on their own will be giving us a phase of minus one on the wave function. But if you do two of them, minus one times minus one is equal to one. So we get that actually one one is an, is an eigenstate of the ZZ operator, but it has an eigenvalue of plus one, exactly the same as a zero, zero state. Two other options are zero, one and one, zero. They are eigenstates of ZZ, but because only one of them pulls out the phase of minus one, they have an eigenvalue of minus one. So when we measure ZZ, the concept of measuring ZZ means that we are trying to distinguish now the not between definite eigenstates, but between eigenbases. So, well, uh, sorry, eigenspaces. So we're trying to work out, is it the eigenspace with eigenvalue plus one or the eigenspace with eigenvalue minus one? Those, that is the only piece of information we want to know and we don't care anything else. So if we've got a superposition, zero, zero plus one, one, and we ask it, is it in the eigen? Uh, base uh, eigenspace of plus one, then the measurement should just tell us yes, because it is the superposition of two states, both of which uh, have an eigenvalue of plus one. Uh, so if you just say yes, it's in that eigenspace and that not affect the state in any other way, it should remain in that superposition state. And I realize I'm saying eigen a lot here, which uh, for people who are new to quantum computing and new to uh, linear algebra, it probably sounds like a, a horrible piece of terminology that sounds confusing, but it's just, it, in this case, it just means that nothing's happening. Although people from Germany or Switzerland, as I live, um, it's, an, it's an actual word that probably just sounds very, uh, very strange to be hearing in a technical, um, technical um, scenario. Anyway, so this is the ZZ. So it's telling us in this case, are they the same or different? And it doesn't tell us any more information. In fact, it's the thing we need to measure for the repetition code. We ask two qubits, are they the same or different? And they tell us, and we don't get any more information than that. If they're a superposition of multiple states that are the same, then they remain in that superposition and our measurement does not disturb it. Um, so then similarly, we can define what we might call XX measurements, which looks whether they're in the on one side in the plus plus or minus minus state in the on the other side in the plus minus or minus plus we can define y measurements and we can also define 
like a ZZZZ measurement where you go through all of the four qubit states. You work out where uh, all of the four qubit bit strings, you work out, uh, is this going to have an eigenvalue of plus one? Is it going to have an eigenvalue of minus one? And then the measurement in the end just decides, just gives you this single bit of information. Are you in that space? Are you one of those states or some superposition thereof? Or are you one of other states and some, or some superposition thereof? It doesn't tell you anything more than that. Okay, so that's uh, a bit of a crash course in multi qubit measurements. Uh, one other important thing about measurement that we are going to need is um, the notion of anti commutation and anti commutation. Uh, so, for example, the X and Z gates anti commute. If you do an X and then a Z, then the result of the, that combination of gates is exactly the same as if you do a z and then an x, except that you get this phase of minus one on the wave function, which seems kind of trivial, but when you apply it to this notion of measurement, uh, what it tells us is that these measurements are completely incompatible with one another. If you were to take a qubit and do an x measurement and then do a z measurement, you would get a very different result than if you first did the z and then did the x. So, for example, if you were in the plus state, so the state of zero plus one, and you were to do an X measurement, then it would tell you, yes, it's definitely in the plus state. If you were then to do a Z measurement, because it's a superposition of zero and one, it will give you a random result. However, if you were first to do the Z measurement, it would give you the random result, but then it would be either zero or one after that and the X, subsequent X measurement would then give you a random result. It's uh, like, you may have seen this demonstration with polarization filters. Um, if you have, it's like that. If you haven't, well, it's still like that, but assuming it doesn't really work for you. Um, so X and Z don't commute. So if you do one of these measurements and then the other, you get nonsense results. But uh, when you go to the multi-qubit case, you get interesting effects such that ZZ and XX on two qubits, they do commute because they anti-commute twice, and that goes back to commuting again. And that means that there are states that have well-defined outcomes for both of those measurements. So look at the state at the bottom here. Uh, this is the superposition of the states 0, 0, and 1, 1. So if you were to ask, um, so if you were to make a ZZ measurement, you're saying, in the Z basis, so for the states zero and one, are you the same as each other or are you different from each other? And zero, zero, they're the same as each other. One, one, they're the same as each other. So it gives you the definite outcome. We're the same of each, as each other. Um, but this state can be rewritten as plus, 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 minus, minus. So similarly, if you were to do this XX measurement and you were to say, are you the same or different as each other it would, in the sort of plus minus states, it would again say the same. So it's um, a definite outcome for both of these. And the, these are the, the states for which this is true are actually a very important set of states called the Bell states. But we're not going to go into more detail about that here. Okay, so we're a good few minutes in and I've mostly been talking about measurements. Um, but yeah, this is one of the most fundamental things about polymer equation, understanding the kind of measurements that we do. So I think it's a good to, to spend to have spent a bit of time on that rather than just my own stuff. And now we're going to look at a particular example of a quantum error correcting code. And it's a, a family of codes that I introduced in that 2015 paper. Um, so it's, um, it's not one of the most normal codes that you might find, like the surface code. Uh, but it's one that's very special to me. Uh, so these codes are defined on a hexagonal lattice. So you have your qubits sitting on the vertices of a hexagonal lattice. And there's three kinds of measurements that are going to be important to us uh, while we're doing this code. One is, well, there's ZZ measurements, as we've already discussed, and these are going to be on the pairs of qubits that are joined by a vertical link. There's going to be XX measurements, uh, which are going to be done on the two qubits joined by that orientation of link. There's uh, YY measurements, which 
are going to be defined on these kinds of links. But then there are going to be six qubit measurements as well. So every hexagon, we call that a plaquette. So around every plaquette, we're going to define x, y, z, x, y, z. So this is a, a six qubit measurement. So it's a bit horrible. There it is. Uh, so we can now look at what commutes with what. So which pairs of measurements um, play nicely together and which pairs of measurements don't play nicely together. Well, the plaquette measurements all commute with each other. So we can we can do the maths and we can see that they all of the plaquette measurements for all of the different plaquettes, they all commute with each other. So that's good. Um, all of the Z, what we, we're going to call these Z links, all of the Z links commute with each other. All of the X links commute with each other. All of the Y links commute with each other. Um, but let's look at relationships between different types of measurement. The Z links commute with the plaquettes because here this Z link is ZZ. This is YX. So the Z anti commutes with the Y. The Z, this Z anti commutes with the X. Two anti commutes make a commute. So they commute. Similarly, the XXs co commute with the plaquette operators. The YYs commute with the plaquette operators. So far, everything commutes. It's all nice and wonderful. But there are exceptions. Uh, the ZZ links and the XX links do not uh, uh, commute with each other. They anti-commute. So if you were to measure one of these and then the other, then the measurement of the first one will completely mess up uh, the measurement result you would have got for the second one. And so, on. so you have to be careful. When things commute, it doesn't matter which order you do them in. I mean, that's what com commutation actually means. Uh, I mean, they're nice and compatible with each other. They live nicely alongside each other. And you can use them to define uh, constraints in a way that doesn't mess the other one up. The anti-commuting ones, I'm not going to place them nicely together. So usually in stabilizer codes, you would avoid anti-commutations. You keep everything commuting. That's not going to be possible in this case, as we're going to see a bit later. Anyway, so we are going to define uh, a code. That means we have to define lots of constraints, which are going to help us to see when something goes wrong. Uh, so our code is going to have uh, the constraint on all plaquette measurements. So um, these measurements, they come out of a, a binary result, a zero or a one. When we measure a plaquette, even though it's a six body operator, it's going to give us a binary result, zero or one. And so we're going to set the constraint. Basically, we want all of the, we want to be in a state where all of the plaquette measurements give us a zero. So that's one of the ways, one of the things we use in the definition of our code. Uh, but also for the Z link, for some set of the link operators, for example, all of the Z links, we are also going to demand then they give us the result zero. So we're going to want to be in a state where all of that is true. And uh, those are going to be the conditions that we set. Um, so how many constraints have we got in that case? Well, let's take every pair of qubits on a Z link. So there's two qubits in such a pair, obviously. Um, for each of those qubits, we can say, well, let's look at the the plaquette to the right. And we find that all of the plaquettes uh, are counted if we do that. If every plaquette is to the right of some Z link. Um, so that means there's half as many plaquettes as there are Z links. And also the fact that there are two qubits in every, oh, sorry, there are half as many plaquettes as there are cub qubits in Z links. There's also half as many Z links as there are qubits in Z links. So it means um, there's, there's half as many. For every Z link, there's two qubits, but there's also a plaquette constraint and a link constraint. So we have as many constraints as we do qubits, which means that we've basically completely constrained our system and there is no room to store any noiseless qubits. Now, this is not entirely true because there will be a boundary to this code and this boundary will have weird stuff going on. So that probably will free up a little bit of space, but we're not going to associate 
our stored qubits with the boundary, at least not in this work. So we're going to have to open up a little bit of space if we want to store some qubits. So how do we do that? Well, there's other choices for the links that we could have had in order to, to define a code. For example, we could have chosen not all of the Z links, but we could have chosen all of the X links, or we could have chosen mostly X links, but with a line of Z links, or we could have chosen all kinds of things, as long as it covers all of the qubits, as long as all of the qubits are involved in one unique link operator that is being used as a constraint, then we completely constrain the system. So what we could do is define something where a couple of those uh, qubits are not involved in the link. If there are two qubits that are not involved in link operators, then we have one less constraint than we do qubits, which gives us space for a single logical qubit. And so what this gives us is little places where they're not involved in these, these link constraints. They are involved in the constraints of plaquettes. So when we measure these constraints to see if they're satisfied, if something has gone wrong on these qubits, we will be able to see that because they are constrained by something, but they aren't part of the link constraints. And we're going to call these defects. And uh, so for every pair of defects, we can associate uh, a qubit. So basically, it's not a qubit that is a little superconducting thing on a chip. It is uh, a qubit that is associated with defects in a uh, quantum error correcting code, but it's a, a qubit nevertheless. Um, now, one interesting thing is that, um, well, we can define a code where we have defects here and here, and we can define a code where we have defects here and here. And the only difference is that in this code, we choose to constrain this pair of qubits with an XX, and in this code, we choose to constrain this pair with a YY. So if we want to go from this to that, we can just decide to stop measuring that constraint, stop enforcing that constraint, and start enforcing this one instead. Now, because the state will not be such that this constraint is enforced, then it might not be true when we first do this. Uh, so it, but uh, at least then we find out if it's true or not, and we can do whatever changes we need to enforce that constraint. So you can kind of think of this as we, we want to move a defect around. We do that by making a particular kind of measurement. Sometimes that measurement tells us, oh, there's some stuff left behind. Then we just pick up that stuff and push it into the defect and then on we go. Uh, so this is something called code deformation. It's a particular example of code deformation. That means we can move these defects around. Um, hey James, we just had a clarification question. Actually, two quick clarification questions. Mm -hmm. um, someone said, you know, I just missed what the strict definition of a plaquette was. Could you remind me what the definition is? Is it six measurements or six different qubits? Yeah. And then also, okay, go ahead. I'll let you do that. Also, yeah, right. in these in these codes, we uh, plaquette is basically just. Um, one of the faces of the lattice. Why we use this weird terminology, I don't know, but we do, so we're kind of stuck with it. But in this case, it basically means hexagon. In this talk, it's going to be synonymous with hexagon. Cool. And then my question was, how do you decide which qubit is the defect qubit again? Um, so the 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 defect ones are the ones that aren't involved in the link measurement. So we measure all of the plaquettes, but we measure only a certain subset of the links. And if there, are, if there's a qubit that is not involved in the link measurement, um, then they are a defect. So I all see. of these are involved in either the x-axis or the z-z, except those two. But the defect could change depending on which links you're using. Like in the previous slide, you had different links showing. So the defect qubit could switch just depending on which links are being used in the code, right? Okay. So depending on how you define your code, your defects might be in different places and you can even choose to move them around. Okay, I got it, thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, so the cool thing about moving these around is that they behave um, as a, as a kind of Majorana mode or Ising anions. Actually, there's a technicality 
that they don't have uh, a global face that they should have. But in terms of um, logical information, uh, the effects they have is the same. And so I'm not going to get into the, the depths of topological quantum computing, uh, which, as Olivia said earlier, is what I did my uh, PhD in. Uh, but basically, it's it's kind of awesome. Uh, you kind of this this quantum error correcting code is basically a universe you've built. These defects are a really weird type of particle that lives in that universe, and you use those particles' exotic properties that don't exist in our universe to build a quantum computer. So if those particles existed, we could use, build a quantum computer out of them. They don't exist, so we use a quantum error correcting code to just build ourselves a new universe in which they do exist. That's cool. I like topological quantum computing. Um, anyway, all of this can be found in my paper on matching codes, which was out in 2015, so I'm just defining those codes here. And one interesting thing I think to point out about that is that in my paper, I have a section where I say, you know what, if you had five qubits, you could demonstrate some weird stuff about moving these uh, defects around and to show that they're my Um And at the time I worked for the University of Basel as a theorist, no one in Basel had five qubits for me to go down their lab and tell them to run this for me. And very few groups in the world had five qubits that had the ability to do this kind of stuff. It was extremely hard to run experiments like that at the time. And then the next year, in 2016, IBM put five qubits online that could do exactly what I needed them to do. And so one lunchtime, when I was in a talk, I suddenly realized, hang on, I, I've got a proposal for an experiment with five qubits. And then by the time I'd left work that day, I had done the experiment. So it's kind of a revolutionary thing that IBM did back then. And, uh, and, and, and I say that as, as the fanboy I was before I joined IBM, rather than just corporate propaganda as the corporate shit I am then. But uh, anyway, yeah, you can do cool stuff with this stuff. It's pretty cool. But anyway, now I'm doing 65 qubit experiments instead of just five qubit experiments. So let's get on with that um, before we completely run out of any time. Um, so how do we measure these link operators? So I've said that these measurements exist, but how do we actually do them? Uh, so for the Z, Z link operators, it's kind of pretty simple. Uh, what you do is you take two, so you take the two qubits you want to measure. So in this circuit, the top qubit here is one of the qubits you want to do a ZZ measurement. With. The bottom qubit is the other qubit you want to do a ZZ measurement of. And this middle qubit is just a, uh, another qubit that you're going to use to help you in this process. And that qubit is going to be initialized in the zero state. So before this process begins, it's initialized in the zero state. Then what you do is two controlled knots, one controlled on one of the qubits that you want to measure with the ZZ and the other controlled on the other, and both of them targeted on the auxiliary qubit. So this auxiliary qubit is now going to receive effectively a number of bit flips depending on what its two neighbors are doing. If they're both zero, it receives no bit flips and so remains in the zero state. If they're both one, it receives two bit flips. It goes from zero to one and back to zero again. In both cases, it ends up zero. However, if one of them's zero and the other one's one, it receives one bit flip and it goes to the one state. So if you then measure, uh, that qubit, then if it's in zero, it tells you that those two qubits that, for which we're doing the ZZ measurement were either both zero or both one. It doesn't tell you which, and it doesn't disturb any superposition of those. If it's in a superposition, it just tells you it's one of those. Um, if it gives you one, it tells you that they were either zero or one, uh, sorry, zero, one, or one, zero, or some superposition thereof. Um, and doesn't give you any further information. So it does exactly what you want from a ZZ measurement uh, using uh, controlled knots and standard measurements and an additional auxiliary qubit. Uh, then you reset it so that you're ready for the next round and um, so on. 
How do you do an XX? Uh, well, one way to do it is to use the phase kickback effect, which you can find out about in the textbook. How do you do a YY? Uh, I hate Ys. They have Ys in them. You have to do, use S gauge and S daggers. I'm not going to tell you how to do YY. It's this circuit. Uh, it's a nice exercise to, to figure out how it works for yourself. But uh, my hatred of Ys means I'm not going to go into any great detail. Also, time. Um, Okay, so this is how you do this is how you do the link operators, but it means that we actually need more qubits than we we had on our, our lattices so far. So far, we've been having our qubits sitting on the vertices. So those are our what we could call code qubits, the ones that define our code. But we also need our auxiliary qubits that sit on the edges that are going to help us do these x, x, y, y, and z, z measurements as we require them. Um, so how are we going to get ourselves a device that has this sort of connectivity? Well, fortunately, it is exactly the connectivity that IBM Quantum gives us in their devices or our devices. Um, so we have our qubits that are laid out like this. Now, we typically, in our images, use this brick wall pattern. But uh, even though they look like rectangles, they are in fact hexagons. This is a hexagonal lattice, it's just squashed. And you can see that we have uh, the vertex qubits and we have the qubits that we're going to use as auxiliary qubits. And I've colored these red, green, and blue for the X, Y, and Z links. So you can see the correspondence between these different images. Um, so we have the ability to do all of these link operate, link measurements, so that's good. Uh, how are we going to do the plaquette measurements? So we can do plaquette measurements in a similar way. So all of these, uh, so we'll have an auxiliary qubit, and then we have all of the six um, qubits around the plaquette. So these are the code qubits that sit around the hexagons, the black ones uh, depicted here. And we could do controlled operations, controlled on the ones we want to measure, targeted on the auxiliary qubit, and we also include some Hadamards and some S gates and some S dagger gates to make sure that we're doing it with an X where we need an X and a Y where we need a Y. Uh, so for what to do that directly, we would need an additional auxiliary qubit sitting in the middle of our plaquettes, and we would need the ability to do controlled gates between all of the code qubits around the plaquette and the auxiliary qubit sitting in the middle of the plaquette. And um, yeah, uh, the, the IBM Quantum Summit is coming up. That's kind of like uh, quantum computing Christmas. So uh, on, on IBM Quantum Summit morn, we can go down to our Dell fridges and see what we get as presents. And uh, I can hope that I'll get this connectivity, but I won't. So uh, we're not actually going to be able to do it directly in this way. Uh, so, how are we going to measure the plaquettes? Well, one thing that we can note is that the plaquette operators, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, are actually a product of all of the link operators around the plaquette. So, if you multiply Z, Z with X, X, then where that Z meets that X on that qubit, they give us a Y. And uh, this X and Y give us a Z. This is all up to I's and minuses and stuff. But, you know. Um, basically, we are multiplying together the link operators, we're getting the back operators. So naively, we might think, well, in that case, can we just measure all of those link operators, squash together their results somehow, and get the result from a plaquette operator? And the naive answer is, unfortunately not, they don't commute, so that wouldn't work. But maybe there's a way. There is a way, otherwise I wouldn't be giving this talk. Um, so let's see another way we could measure this link operator or this plaquette operator now x y z x y z is to do an x measurement of this qubit a y measurement of that qubit a z measurement of this qubit and then an x and a y and a z each of those gives us a zero or a one we then add all of those zeros and ones up and take that result mod two which gives us a zero or a one and that is the result of our plaquette measurement. And this works because all of these commute with each other. Even though this is an X and a Y, they're on different qubits, so they commute. 
um, and so on. So we, because they all commute with each other, that trip works. However, it would be a bad thing to do because uh, it doesn't commute with a whole bunch of stuff. It doesn't commute with the neighboring plaquettes. So you can measure one qubit like this, but you sacrifice all of its neighboring. So you can measure one plaquette like this, but you sacrifice all the neighbors. Uh, it doesn't uh, commute with the neighboring link operators, so they get messed up as well. It also disentangles all of the qubits. Your entanglement is gone. So it's really a really destructive way to measure a plaquette operator. This is the way you measure a plaquette operator when you want to know what that plaquette is doing right now and you just don't care about the rest of the universe because you're going to break everything. Um, but it does show that if we measure things that commute, then we can combine them to get um, something that they... If we take two things, uh, that combine to create something else, and those two things commute, and we combine, can combine their results. So if we split the plaquette operator into two halves, instead of make, having the uh, product of all of the link operators, we can have one half, which is the product of half of the link operators, and another, which is the product of the other half. These commute with each other. So if we measure this link, this half plaquette operator, and we measure this half plaquette operator, and we combine their results, that would be a way of measuring our plaquette operator. Uh, also, they commute with all of the other plaquettes, so it doesn't mess everything up. Uh, the trouble is that measuring these six body operators is just as hard as measuring the one that we actually need to measure. So we've taken a difficult task and turned it into two difficult tasks, which is not really very much progress. Um, but to measure the first half, we can measure its three link operators. It's a product of three link operators which don't touch each other, and because they don't touch each other, they don't overlap on any qubits, they actually commute with each other. So we can measure those three, and we can combine their results to get the first half plaquette operator. Also, because all of those link operators commute with the second half plaquette operator, then it doesn't mess up. Uh, so all of these link operators we're measuring don't commute with the individual link operators that make up the second half plaquette operator, but they uh, they commute with the half plaquette operator as a whole. So everything is fine. And then we can similarly take the second half plaquette operator, uh, split that up into its constituent link operators, and we find that if we measure all of the link operators and combine the results, it does measure a bucket operator and it does it in a way that doesn't mess up any of the other bucket operators. We've just got to make sure to do it in the right order. We've got to do these three first, doesn't matter which order we do them in, and then we've got to do those three, doesn't matter which order we do those in. As long as we do those that three first and that three next, um, it's good. So we have a way of measuring the plaquette operators, which uh, commutes with all the other plaquette operators, so they don't get messed up. Uh, however, it doesn't commute with the link operators that touch that plaquette. So, and because of that, when you measure those link operators, when you, when you try to enforce those constraints again, you will find that the constraint that you wanted is not necessarily satisfied anymore. There could be some mess. So basically measuring a packet operator in this way creates a mess around it, but it's a mess that is completely detectable by the link operators. So if you measure all of the link operators to see what you are before you do the packet measurement, then you do the packet measurement, then you measure all the link operators again, then you will see, okay, I made a little mess, so I'll clear up that mess, and you're good to continue. Uh, and then you can measure your next packet and then you can measure your next packet and so on and so forth. Uh, but you don't really want to do your packet measurements one by one in this way. But what you can do is do them in shifts such that these messes do not overlap and so can be dealt with independently. So here I have shift zero, um, shift one, shift two, and shift three. So if you, you do a quarter of the packet measurements and then you do another quarter, and you do another quarter, and then you do another quarter, and then you're done. Uh, and between all of those shifts, you measure all of the link operators and you can detect the messes that you're making. 
Uh, so you're measuring the link operators you need, you're measuring the packet operators you need. So you're measuring to see if the, these constraints that you have set are satisfied. You are necessarily bringing in little messes where the constraints aren't satisfied, but you can clean these up. And so in this way, you have all of the information you need to detect the, any errors that happen without making any big problems. Uh, so yeah, I've already said this, um, the shift calls uh, localized messes. Uh, but one thing that's important to point out is that if we take the product of these four link operators, then uh, that product doesn't see the mess. So it's kind of like um, when you see a mess when you when you've you're looking at a place and the mess um, leaves that place that you're looking at. If you look at something that contains an entire mess, you don't see it. Okay, that doesn't really make very much sense of them as a comparison, but uh, so when you're you only see the edge of a mess. So when you're looking at this product, you're kind of looking at a whole area, you don't see the mess. So it's something um, that is basically like another way of doing a measurement around the plaquette that won't be seeing any mess, but will just be telling you about noise that's happening. So what we're going to do now is not try and store any information in here, not do any quantum computing, not correct anything. We are just going to make these measurements and see what happens when we make these measurements, see what kind of errors we see, see how much error we see, uh, and see how um, actual devices behave when measured in this way. Um, so we're going to use two kinds of device. We're going to use the Falcon devices. So that's a particular architecture for IBM quantum devices. It's the ones depicted at the top here. And uh, they have 27 qubits. And we're going to use Hummingbird devices which are the ones at the bottom, and they have 65 qubits. And we are going to run a free route of these plaquette measurements and do all of the link operators and link measurements that we need uh, between those as well. And then we are going to look for each of the plaquettes, how often does its value change? So this is how often does it see some sort of an error? How often is this measurement not what we expect it to be given the constraints that we have set and therefore is um is evidence of something going wrong so an error happening and we're going to do that for the plaquette operators and we're also going to do it for these products of link operators which don't see the mess um and with this we are going to average these over the all of the rounds that we've done and all the plaquettes that we do and then we are going to have two numbers the probability that plaquette operators see something go wrong and the probability that products of link operators around the plaquette see something go wrong. And these are going to be our two figures of merit telling us what's going on in a particular device. Hey, James. Uh, yeah. Sorry. You might have mentioned it. Maybe I missed it. What were the different colored qubits representing on the previous slide? So on this slide, um, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, so I just pulled this out of the figure and it's uh, in the paper and it's fully explained in the caption. Uh, but one aspect is that see here, we've got two qubits and we've got an auxiliary qubit. We can do a ZZ measurement in a completely normal way. Here, uh, we've got somewhere where a Z link should sort of fit in, but there's not the cube, there's only this qubit there. So we can't do the ZZ measurement in a normal way but we can kind of truncate the ZZ measurement into just doing a Z measurement from the single qubit. So here I flagged up the qubits that are weird in this way. So we're, we're effectively doing ZZ measurements, even though there's only one qubit. Uh, and this one is just showing um, a possible configuration of these four Z links around the plaquette that define these products of link operators. Okay. And I think there was another question maybe on the previous slide. I'm not sure where you had mentioned that if we didn't do this in a very precise, you know, way, we would create a, yes, an uncorrectable mess. Yeah. Uh, somebody wanted to know exactly what you meant by that. Okay. Yeah. So the fact that the mess is, 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 um, localized around the plaquette means that you are gonna, you're going to see an even number of things. 
you're going to see an even number of these link operators complain that something's go wrong, gone wrong. And uh, and then what you can kind of think of this as doing is we, you, you can take two of these complaints and you can do some operations which push them together and then they annihilate each other. So if you've got, if you just find two, you do the operations required to push those together and annihilate each other. If you've got four, you do you choose any two pairs and you annihilate them. Everything's all good. Uh, but if you were to do this on all of the plaquettes at once, then you would not anymore have this promise that are that on those four things you get an even number of things and you can just annihilate them locally. You would have the promise that over the entire code you have an even number of things. And some some of the ways you could clear up that mess are good, and some of the half the ways you can clear up the mess are good, half the ways you can clear up the mess are bad, and there's no way of knowing which you should do. So you have to keep your messes small uh, in order to to know how to to clean them up in a way that doesn't cause problems. If you were to have if the messes overlap each other then they just become a big mess, and that is uh, something you can't clear up. So hopefully that makes a bit more sense. Yep, I think that clears it up. Let's uh, let's keep going. Um, so yeah, I did this for uh, for simulation. So I simulated a, a Falcon device, so a 27 qubit device, with a standard error model where you basically assume everything in the circuit goes wrong with probability P. So you do a measurement, with probability P, it lies to you. You, re, you reset your qubit to be the zero state. With probability P, it's the one state. And every gate with probability P, you get depolarizing noise. Um, so I did those simulations, and then oh, this should be an X rather than a minus. And I looked at what is the probability that the link, the plaquette operators see, see the evidence of some noise. And as you increase the probability of noise, the probability they see evidence of noise increases. What's the probability that link operators see evidence of noise? As you increase the noise, that probability also increases. And both of them converge to half because at half, that is the maximum entropy case. When you're completely, your device is completely burning with noise, then uh, whether it's your uh, measurement sees evidence of noise is going to be 50 50 because often two errors will um, cancel each other out and that's why it's 50 50 rather than one so being up here means that everything is just horrible it's too noisy you don't know what's going on being down here you're actually getting to discern some information about what noise is happening so you want to be down here and one percent noise is what we kind of usually think of as as what we need to be at or below in order to do quantum error correction. Um, so I want to run this on real devices and plot um, numbers from real devices on this plot. But there's obvious where I'm going to put them on the y-axis. I just put them where those numbers are. Uh, but where am I going to put them on the x-axis? A, a device is not something characterized by a single noise probability. It's uh, a big complicated thing with lots of noise processes. So what I did do was just take the same processes as go on in the error model, find the corresponding probability that that would happen on the device according to the benchmarking that is done on the device. And then I just took the mean of that. And then I get a kind of average noise for each device. You see that Cairo and Hanoi are down at the one and a half level and um, one and a half percent. Other devices are up in the higher percents. Manhattan comes out as crazy high, but I think I think it's benchmarking was having a bad day rather than the device actually being that bad. If we then take results from the real devices and put these on the plot, then we see that uh, Cairo and Hanoi, which are down at the between one and two percent level, do come out with results for how we're performing these measurements that are consistent with being down at the one or two percent level. Uh, so the probability, this is the probability that the product of link operators is going to um, tell us that there's evidence of noise and it's well below half. So it's well below the maximum entropy case, which is what we would see if this was just completely burning with noise and it couldn't discern anything. 
So it's it's nice to see those down here. Uh, other devices are up, only seeing things at the kind of maximum entropy case. So what this is telling us is, uh, at the very least, this code, this way of performing measurements, is not very well. It doesn't suit well these devices. There's things going on in these devices that cause it to fail more often than you would ideally want. That doesn't mean these devices are necessarily bad. There might be other codes that perform better, but at least for this code, we see a definite, these devices, pretty good. Those devices, not so good. Or well, you should use them for other things and not this code. Uh, so the best things we can say are that some of the devices have uh, results equivalent to one or two percent noise, which is where we want to be at or below to do quantum error correction. So we are well on the road to quantum error correction with this architecture, with this hardware, which is good to see. Um, but other devices uh, aren't there yet. So we we and the plaquette measurements as well. In all cases, we're not seeing them well below that maximum entropy case. So we would really want to, to see in future devices um, better results on those. And if we look at, uh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll get, so actually let's go here already. If we look at, in a more fine-grained way at what the error uh, processes are in the devices, then the, the error processes that matter the most, the ones that are the most uh, the highest strength and the ones that are probably contributing to this are the, where we're idling during measurement. So this means that some qubits are just sitting there doing nothing while other qubits are getting measured and reset. And the, the errors that we have during the idling process are the ones that are really contributing to this. So that's something that um, we should uh, look towards uh, fixing. And we have a, a new device recently, which has T1 and T2 times, which are the time scales for errors while idling, uh, which are much higher and so much better than we have in any of these devices. So it'll be interesting to see when uh, these codes are run on that device, whether that translates into uh, better results. Um, so that's what I would like to see that the people making hardware do. Um, make the device better, basically, which is, of course, they know that's on their to-do list already. Uh, for the code itself, um, things I should do are um, write the decoder and determine the threshold. So this is um, the way the threshold is the amount of noise it can take before it doesn't really work. And it's very important when we're comparing different codes to figure out the thresholds. Uh, because there are other codes that are, have been proposed uh, for this architecture that we have at IBM Quantum. And I've got uh, a paper on the screen now from some of my colleagues on another code that has been defined on this architecture, so you can check that out. There are other, there are other uh, papers that have also been considered recently that are on this architecture. So we really need to see which one's the best, and uh, I have to do some more work in figuring out uh, how to do that for this code. Um, another aspect in this work is that uh, Another thing that I do experimentally is run repetition codes uh, because they're very simple and they can be run on pretty much all devices, even the publicly available devices, you can do repetition codes. And uh, one thing that's really great to do that is just do loads and loads of syndrome measurement rounds to see how the probability of errors change over long circuits. I would love to do that in, for this code as well, uh, but in the control systems, the amount of data that flows out of the, the circuit when you're constantly measuring all the time uh, can sometimes cause it to deliver an error. Sometimes it will do it for a fine and sometimes it won't. So uh, I think that that is something that they're already working on, uh, but it's something that's very important when we do a quantum error correction because we need to do these measurements a lot. Um, so finally, that is uh, all I have to tell you. So thank you for your attention. And if you want to do some quantum error correction yourself, then the devices that are publicly available don't allow you to run this particular code. But if you want to run repetition codes, we have tools for that in Qiskit, and you can find some information about that at the link on the screen now. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take any more questions that you have. Thanks, James. 
Um, that was really, really great. I was not familiar with that type of error correction. So we do have a few more questions. Um, the first one is, how does this way of measuring the plaquettes with four groups separated by link operators compare to the Hastings and Han way of just cycle measuring the three link directions? This way seems slower. I'm not familiar with what that is. Uh, are you? So the Hastings and Han is another proposed way of um, of doing uh, quantum error correction on this architecture, and uh, I think my way is slow. So that's true. And if we, so it would be really good to see what the thresholds are because that may translate to a lower threshold. Uh, in my case, uh, what I really love about this code is the fact that you uh, that you do um, uh, logical um, logical qubits correspond to these defects, and you can do this while you're on the braiding, and it's very really great for doing um, fault tolerant uh, Clifford gates. So. These are the many kind of things that you have to work out with a code to see which code is better than other codes. How well do they fit active architecture? What is their threshold like? How can you actually do logical operators on them? Um, yeah, so it'd be great to see how mine compares to uh, the Hastings and Han. But yeah, I think the Hastings and Han do their measurements a bit more efficiently. Okay, cool. And then I was wondering if you could maybe comment um, on the specific devices themselves. I think I noticed from the chart that the ones with higher quantum volume, for instance, were not the ones that had performed best with this code overall. So I was just wondering why these specific devices at the top here were the ones that performed best, if you had any idea. Yeah, I think it's with uh, quantum volume, you are not using the entire device, but you're you're finding the bit that works the best and sort of building up and. Um, whereas in this, you do use the entire device, and I believe in the quantum volume, you don't uh, ever do measurements and then do things after the measurement, uh, which you have to do in this. So, it, yeah, it was an interesting thing that quantum volume does not seem to be a predictor necessarily of how well a device will behave in, in quantum error correction. It's a good predictor of maybe things related more to uh, near term applications of quantum computing, but for the quantum error correction, I mean, this isn't. Um, enough evidence to declare that quantum volume isn't a good predictor of how anything will work in any quantum error equation. But it's an interesting sort of bucking of the trends that, that was noted. Yeah, I thought that was interesting um, myself. Okay, so um, I think we have one more question. Uh, and this person wanted to know, so what exactly would be the benefit if Santa or the experimental were able to create your your dream chip what would actually change in terms of your your work and your measurement yeah so then you would just uh, you would have a single circuit which does control gates to the control qubit uh, in the middle of the plaquette you would not need to build it up out of multiple two qubit operations you would not need to do something which anti-commuted with the link operated around so you wouldn't make any messes you would be able to do all of your plaquettes at the same time. And um, without making any messes, it would be much better for your for your uh, the speed of your syndrome measurements. It would be better for your code distance because these messes also cause uh, shortcuts for how uh, logical logical errors could form. So it would make everything behave a bit better. And um, yay. You just get on with doing your quantum, com com quantum computing then. So hopefully it was an experimentalist asking that. And now they're convinced and they're going to go to the lab and just uh, stick that qubit in there. I'm sure it's that easy. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm going to get right on it right after this, James. I'm going to head into the lab and tell people we need to we need to stop what we're doing. We have a new plan for the afternoon. Yes. So I look forward to seeing it in my deal fridge on, on uh, the morning of the summit. Sounds good. Um, I think. That wrapped up our uh, question queue. So I just wanted to thank James one more time for being here for us today and giving us that really interesting talk. Um, so yeah, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, make sure you do that because we have these talks every Friday at noon. And with that, I'll just say have a great weekend and happy Halloween. We'll see you next week. Thanks. See ya.